Next book. Final Fantasy VII, The Story Second Installment. Author, Emerald Princess of Vernia. Words, 178,143. Rating, K+. Summary, the second installment of a complete novelization of Final Fantasy VII. This installment covers Costa del Sol to the Northern Cave. See installments 1 and 3 for the rest of the story. Please read and review. Episode 1, Part 05, Chapter 01 Part 5, Study of the Planet Chapter 1 After a full hour of driving in the late afternoon, Cloud and the gang finally reached the southern part of the western continent, the only way to cross to the far western part of the continent. Thanks to the buggy given to them by the Gold Saucer theme park as an apology for wrongly locking them up in the desert prison, the journey had become much quicker and a whole lot easier. With the buggy's specially designed track wheels they had been able to cross the desert surrounding the gold saucer with ease, the pits of quicksand unable to get a hold of them and pull them down. The buggy also came in handy after they crossed the rest of the continent, heading southwards once again in their ongoing pursuit of Sephiroth. Another large river separated the continent, so wide it would have been impossible to cross on foot, but the buggy allowed them to cross the river easily, with only spray flying up from the wheels as it rode over, splashing them all with cool water. Eris drove most of the way, feeling glad to be doing something and allowing the others to take a rest as they drove on. She had guided them out of the desert and across the river despite offers from Cloud to take over. It was only after they had crossed the river and were driving freely down the forest plains that Eris allowed Tifa to take over control of the buggy, while she went to the back of the vehicle and sat with Cloud in Red 13. Yuffie was sitting on top of the buggy, perched on the back of the seats. She looked a little pale, even just riding in a buggy, but was also enjoying the feeling of the breeze through her short hair. Apart from the moments when Cloud had offered to take over the driving of the buggy, he had been silent throughout the journey. As the buggy had hummed along the plains he had been sat with his back resting against the back of the buggy, with Dio's letter still in his hand. He had read the letter over and over again, or, in particular, the last part of the letter where Dio talked of seeing Sephiroth. For some reason it bothered him that Sephiroth had been to the gold saucer. Although Sephiroth had not been responsible for any of the deaths caused there, it was still a wonder to him why he had been there in the first place. The Gold Saucer was simply a theme park and had nothing to do with their search, going to the Gold Saucer had just been a mere coincidence in an attempt to lighten their journey and lift everyone's mood, despite its unpredicted consequences. While the light-hearted chit-chat went on in the background, namely Ares's casual comments about Barrett's behavior in the desert prison, Cloud continued to read the last part of the letter, and Dio's remark of Sephiroth having fans. Back in the days before Nibelheim fell, Sephiroth had had a lot of fans, especially with boys Cloud's age. Of course, when Sephiroth disappeared after that, Shinra had done its best to keep it all covered up. Not many people knew what Sephiroth had done, especially since there were very few survivors from then. A lot of people still remembered and admired Sephiroth. Everyone else just didn't talk about. There it is, called Tifa from the driving seat. Cloud looked up, scrunching up the letter and shoving it roughly in his pocket, before he climbed to his knees and knelt with Eris and Red 13, looking out at the place where they were arriving. Up ahead of them was a fairly small forest, identified on the world map as Gongaga. Even though the forest was fairly dense and compact, they could just about see the tops of a tall black structure poking up through the trees. They couldn't see much of it at first through the growth of trees, but as they drove closer it soon became clear what the unnatural, eyesore of a structure was. A Mako Reactor, Cloud muttered under his breath. The group fell silent for a minute as they watched the reactor come into view. Of course, they couldn't see the whole of the reactor, although they knew that the small town of Gongaga would also be in the middle of the forest. They were surprised, however, to see that the forest and the land surrounding the reactor was still rather lush and verdant. There were faint traces of grey here and there, but green grass was quickly growing over that. They were forced to come to a stop at the entrance of the forest, right next to a small path leading into the forest. It was much too small for the buggy to ride through, so they had no choice but to part the buggy as close as they could to the forest's edge before they went inside. The forest was just as silent on the inside as it appeared on the outside. There were no other signs of life other than that of the trees and plants, no birds chirping, no scurrying animals. In fact, apart from the sounds of their footsteps lightly pressing on dirt and fallen twigs, and the occasional breeze fluttering through the leaves of the trees, it was silent. There was only one path to follow and so they followed it, hoping it would lead them to Gongaga. They were a few minutes into the forest when Cloud suddenly stopped right in the middle of the path. He raised a hand to the others as an order to stay silent, 
before he turned back to the path ahead of them, which curved around slightly behind a clump of trees and bushes, preventing him from seeing. There, just under the silence of the forest, came the sounds of faint noises. They were very quiet, almost like whispers, but definitely audible through the silence of the trees. Is someone there? Cloud whispered, also keeping his voice low. The others all kept themselves to the side out of sight as Cloud slowly edged forwards towards the curve, trying to peer round the corner without being spotted himself. He edged in as close as he dared, before he looked out at the figure beyond. Just around the corner from where they were, Cloud saw that the road they were following suddenly split into two, one road continuing ahead with a small sign saying Gongaga ahead of it, and a second road moving to the right, presumably to the Mako reactor. Standing at the entrance to that fork were two men, men that Cloud unfortunately realized. The trademark blue uniforms and black shades, there was no doubt that they were Reno and Root of the Turks. Cloud remembered the last time they had encountered Reno, back in Midgar. It was by Reno's hand that the bomb used to destroy the Sector 7 pillar was activated. Cloud had to wonder what they were doing so far out, especially without any signs of Shinra anywhere. Hey, Rude, Reno said suddenly, lifting his voice a little. Who do you like? Cloud pressed himself as far back against the tree as he could and watched as Rude looked back at Reno blankly. He couldn't really hear what they were talking about from where he was, but for a second he thought he saw Rude's face turn slightly red, before he hurriedly looked away from Reno and crossed his arms. What are you so embarrassed about? Reno asked, also noticing the sudden flush on Rude's face. Come on. Who do you like? Rude still didn't answer and refused to look at Reno. Then he took a deep breath and muttered quietly under his breath. Tifa. He looked up as Reno jumped about half a meter into the air, before he turned away again to hide the flush on his face. Hum. Reno said once the initial shock had passed, and he scratched his head thoughtfully, pushing back the strips of red hair that hung over his face. That's a tough one. But, poor Elena. She. You. Rude shook his head. No, she likes Tseng. I never knew that. Reno exclaimed, clearly shocked for the second time. Then he stopped. But Tseng likes that ancient. What are they talking about? Cloud wondered quietly to himself. He tried to lean forward a little more to try and hear what they were talking about, careful not to lean out too far otherwise they would spot him, or he would fall from his spot. While he and the others were absorbed in trying to listen to Reno and Rude's conversation, they didn't notice the third blue-suited figure walk up behind them, until she stopped beside Cloud and put her hands on her hips crossly. It's so stupid! She exclaimed, making Cloud jump. Elena turned away from him and looked out at Reno and Rude still talking, a cross expression on her face. They always talk about who they like or don't like. But Tseng is different. She stopped very suddenly and slowly turned to look back at Cloud and then round at the others standing around her. She suddenly jumped violently. Ah! Oh no! Before anyone could stop her she brushed past they, dashing towards Reno and Rude. They're here! She called out to them. They're really here! Rude and Reno both turned as Elena ran up to them, and saw Cloud and his group standing on the path behind them. Although Elena was excited and nearly hysterical they didn't seem too surprised, which set off warning bells in Cloud's head. Hmm. Then it's time said Reno. He gave Rude a quick glance. Rude. Don't go easy on them even though they're girls. Don't worry, I'll do my job, Rude replied simply. Then, we're counting on you, said Elena. I'll report to Tseng. She gave her two comrades a brief salute before she turned away and ran quickly down the right-hand path leading towards the Gongagamako reactor, leaving Reno and Rude behind to deal with Cloud and the others. Once she was gone, Reno began to walk casually towards the group, the fingers of his right hand gingerly playing with the button of his sleeve. It's been a while, he said. He looked particularly at Cloud, Barrett, and Tifa as he spoke. Payback time for what you did in Sector 7. He stopped right in front of Cloud and looked directly into Cloud's eyes. Cloud stared back defiantly, refusing to move or look away. Reno was not much taller than he was, and he certainly didn't intimidate Cloud. Yet it angered Cloud that Reno was talking about the fight they had had on top of the pillar, and not the destruction of Sector 7 and the death of hundreds of people. Cloud then realized that Reno did remember, as a smug and superior smile spread on his face, sniggering quietly. Out of our way, Cloud replied angrily. 
As a word of warning, he reached up and placed his hand firmly around the hilt of his sword, ready to draw it at any moment. Behind him the others all placed their hands on their weapons and stood ready. Reno looked at the sword blankly, as equally unimpressed as Cloud was not intimidated. Then he glanced over Cloud's shoulder and looked at the others. The smile disappeared from his face as it turned into a frown, and he looked back at Cloud. I don't like being taken for a fool, he said. That's as far as you go, said Rude. The moment Rude finished speaking, Reno suddenly whipped his right arm out to the side and a long metal pole with a short metal handle slid quickly out from under his sleeve where he had been hiding it. Reno grabbed it and flipped it up, bringing it down quickly towards Cloud, who was drawing his sword at the same time in anticipation of a battle. There was a loud clash of metal on metal and a flash of sparks as the two weapons collided. Cloud had his sword held out flat in front of him, his other hand pressed against the blade at the other end, keeping it steady in front of him as Reno brought the pole down hard. Now the two were locked in an instant stalemate. Tifa ran forward, past Cloud and Reno, and towards Root who was waiting patiently behind them. As Tifa ran towards him, her fists clenched and ready, he lifted his own fists. Instead of attacking his brought his arms together vertically in front of him in a defensive position, so when Tifa punched outwards with all her might she did not do any damage, and simply punched his arms. That didn't stop her from trying again and this time aimed for his head, only to miss again as Rude broke his defense position and lifted his arm up in front of his face, catching her fist as it approached him and pushing it up harmlessly above his head so that she was punching the air. Like Tifa, Rude also knew a thing or two about martial arts. Reno and Cloud had managed to break from their stalemate at that moment, and Reno was now locked between Red 13, Cloud and Barrett. With so many people gathered in such a small space Barrett didn't dare to use his gun for fear of the bullets ricocheting off the trees and hitting one of the others. Red 13 broke the impasse and dived up, trying to clamp his powerful jaws around Reno's arm and force him to drop the bar. However Reno predicted his move and quickly spun around away from Cloud, whipping the bar with him. An almighty yelp rang through the air as the bar connected with the side of Red 13's face, followed by a string of blood that came from the hound's nose. The force of the blow caused Red 13 to swerve aside and ram into Barrett as he was preparing to cast a ball of ice at the Turk. Red 13's bulk made Barrett lose his concentration and the ball cast off harmlessly into the air where it hit a nearby tree and Barrett and Red 13 fell over onto the floor. Meanwhile Reno was still spinning around at that point. As he turned his head he caught the flash of something silver heading towards him, and he very quickly brought his arm up and caught the sharp edge of Cloud's blade with the bar, and they were back in the temporary stalemate. Reno looked over the rim of his bar and looked up at Cloud, a huge sneer on his face. Cloud looked back at him with a fixed gaze, not faltering for a second. Reno was about to say something when he noticed faint flickers of blue-white light beginning to spread on Cloud's sword. He realized only just in time and quickly jumped back away from the sword, just as Cloud's sword became alive with electricity, using the combination of materia to make the blade electrical. At that moment Tifa was still locked in a fierce martial combat with Rude. There was little that Eris, Yuffie, or Cat could do apart from form a border around the two, preventing Rude from trying to break out of the circle. Tifa was very relentless in unleashing all of the skills she had learned against Rude, not letting him have even a second to try and counterattack. The main advantage came from the fact that she was younger and much more agile than Rude was. Thanks to her training in Nibelheim from a fairly young age she had built up enough stamina and speed to keep her going for much longer, and try moves that Rude couldn't because of his uniform restricting him somewhat. Yet, despite her skills, she was totally unprepared as she jumped up into the air, her leg straight as she brought it round for a kick to Rude's head. In a flash Rude suddenly ducked down and dashed beneath her, passing under harmlessly as she kicked the air and headed for the ground. As Tifa landed Rude was behind her and in the perfect position. He brought his flat palm around and hit her hard on her back in between her shoulder blades, making her fall forward onto the ground, stunned. That was when the others jumped in. Eris ran forward and spun her staff round in a circle, but one simple expert punch from Rude knocked it from her hands and let it fall onto the floor, Eris falling with it. Cat bounded forward on his mog form and bounded up, his megaphone held high and the mog's arms up high as he prepared to bring them both down on Rude while his back was turned. Yet Rude was prepared for that too, and with a sudden burst of speed he bent down and picked up Eris's staff, flicking it round and jabbing it out at the cat. The staff hit the cat right off the mog's body and it fell harmlessly to the floor, along with cat. Without his control, the mug lost its movement and collapsed face down onto the floor, leaving Yuffie the only one holding a weapon. She charged forward and began to whip the shuriken in front of Rude's face, making him dodge aside away from its sharp points. Cloud swiped his electrified sword at Reno again, before he stepped back and held the blade up high. 
the electricity on the blade intensified as the new piece of materia he recently inserted flashed brightly with lightning, and when Cloud brought his sword down the lightning jumped off his blade and struck the ground in front of him. The lightning hit the ground with such force that it made the soil explode, forming a large mound in the middle of the clearing, and still rising. Yuffie, who was at that moment pinned down with her shuriken pressed against her throat by Rude, kicked him in the shin and quickly dashed aside out of the way. The tip of the mound acted like a lightning rod and brought all of the lightning flashing around the mound together. When all the bolts came together they exploded in a shower of sparks, illuminating a solitary figure that was standing on top of the mound amongst the lightning. The figure was Ramo, the summon beast contained within the Materia Cloud had picked up in the gold saucer waiting room. He was an old man in a long white cloak and a white beard, holding a long staff designed to conduct lightning. Root and Reno both stepped back and braced themselves as the old man lifted his staff up high into the air. The lightning grew closer together around the tip of the staff, before it exploded again and was cast out around the clearing. The lightning flickered out and around the perimeter of the clearing, narrowly missing Tifa and the others who had pressed themselves amongst the trees and bushes to hide from the lightning bolts. The bolts also crackled over the bodies of Reno and Root as they stood in the clearing. By the time the lightning finished its explosive discharge the mound had already sunk back into the earth, and Ramu had disappeared. As the last of the lightning disappeared Root and Reno both staggered back, lightning sparks still flickering off their clothes and Reno's hair slightly static from the charge. For a moment or two everyone was silent, watching as Rude and Reno stood quietly in the middle of the clearing. Yuffie was edging out from her hiding place in between two trees, her shuriken raised as she prepared to throw it at the two while they were silent. In fact, she was just about to throw it when the silence was suddenly broken by a loud beeping sound coming from Rude. Reno slowly opened his eyes and looked over at Rude as he pulled back the sleeve of his left hand and pushed a button on his watch, stopping the beeping. He nodded at Reno, who smiled smugly and turned back to Cloud and the others, who were gathering in front of him. We may be retreating, but... We're still victorious, he said, and glanced at Rude. The other Turk replied silently. With one final glance at his watch the two Turks then turned and fled from the area, following the same path Elena had in running towards the Mako reactor. Everyone else stayed in the clearing, watching as the Turks turned the corner and disappeared into the deeper parts of the forest. Once they were gone and out of sight and hearing, Cloud turned around to the group, scratching his head. Hey, something seems wrong, Tifa said, voicing the same thought that had filled everyone's head at that moment. Like they knew we were coming. Cloud nodded slowly in agreement. They followed us. He assumed, watching as Eris went over to Red 13 and began to wipe the traces of blood from his nose with a cloth, and preparing to attach a small plaster until the wound healed. But there weren't any signs of it. Then, that means... Someone's been informing them, Red 13 finished, wrinkling his nose to shift the uncomfortable plaster a little, which was causing him to itch. Maybe it's someone in this group, said Yuffie. All at once everyone in the group looked around at everyone else, trying to find something in their faces that would somehow give them away. But everyone had the same expression, nervous and slightly suspicious of everyone else. You don't think there's a spy, do you Cloud? Cat asked suddenly. He had finally managed to climb back onto his Mog body, and was looking at Cloud almost pleadingly. As he watched the Mog began to hop nervously from one foot to the other. I hate this. Now everyone's gonna blame me because I'm new. Cloud turned away, blocking out the gazes of the others as he thought carefully about their new predicament. If there were a spy amongst them then it would be a problem for them all, Shinra would know their every move and be able to move ahead of them, as well as know everything that they did. The one question he had to ask was, who? Barrett? Eris? Tifa? Red 13? Yuffie? Cat? He had no doubt the others were thinking the same. If this had happened in Midgar, Barrett would have wasted no time in blaming Cloud for being an ex-member of Soldier, but what if he... He shook his head fiercely, blocking out the thoughts. I don't even want to think that there's a spy. He said, breaking the uncomfortable silence that had spread between them all. He turned back to the nervous gazes of the others, clearly waiting for some words of encouragement. I trust everyone. He said, hoping that would do. It did somewhat. The others looked a little more relieved to hear it at least. Still Cloud turned away again and began to walk silent down the second path leading out of the clearing, the one leading to the town of Gongaga. Barrett and the others soon began to follow him, 
while Eris gave Kat a comfortable pat on the shoulder, and they also followed on towards Gongaga. End of chapter Episode 2, Part 05, Chapter 02 Chapter 2 Gongaga In the middle of the forest, Cloud and the gang soon found the small forest village of Gongaga. It was built in a large clearing where the trees had been cut away and the soil replaced by a fine dirt path, the inhabitants living in small houses that were scattered about throughout the clearing. The first thing that they noticed as they entered the clearing was the immense silence that had spread throughout the entire village. There were so few houses and so few people around, it was hard to believe that there were people actually living here. A few of the houses had been boarded up, with planks of wood nailed firmly across the windows to stop people from seeing in. The second thing they noticed was a graveyard built right at the entrance of the village. A large graveyard filled with old graves roughly dug in the dirt, topped by old gravestones of dark rock, the names of the dead carved roughly onto them. One man was standing at the entrance to the graveyard, almost like a guard. His face was somber, the creases of an ever-present frown forming on his face, and he wasn't even that old. There was also a woman inside the graveyard, kneeling beside one of the graves, and tears pouring down her face as she laid a bouquet of flowers in front of the gravestone. While the likes of Tifa and Eris looked on sympathetically at the graveyard, silently counting the many graves that stood there, Cloud turned away and took a few more steps into the village. He stopped again and peered up over the small cluster of houses in the far north of the village, above the fence that surrounded the village and kept it separate from the forest. There it was, sticking out like a dark shadow that was a continuous reminder of the village's misery. It was another Mako reactor, built not too far away from the village. In fact it looked a little too close to the village for comfort, but as Cloud looked a little closer he could see that it was no longer a problem. The reactor was a total ruin. From what Cloud could see, the reactor was misshapen and broken down, many of its mako-sucking towers fallen apart. It explained the growth of fresh plants and flowers, and the way the dark, dead soil was quickly being replenished with energy and life. Without the reactor there to suck up the mako, there was no way the plants could die. A ruined reactor, Cloud muttered softly. He glanced back at the many graves. They all looked like they dated from the same period, and Cloud slowly pieced the information together. There must have been some form of explosion at the reactor, one big enough to destroy it completely and stop the flow of Mako running through it. With the reactor being so close to the village, it had probably killed some of them. Evidence of that came from the remains of the reactor that were still lying in the village. It also explained the miserable faces of those few wandering in the village. They soon left the lonely graveyard and headed into the village. Not many people noticed them enter, they were so wrapped up in their own miseries they didn't have the time to notice. Cloud looked around at the few houses that there were. It was clear that many of them had been repaired, and he presumed that the ones that weren't boarded up were the ones with people still living in them. And although it was very obvious that Sephiroth had not come anywhere near Gongaga, it couldn't hurt to ask someone if they had seen anything and could help them. He led the others towards one of the houses, the house in the most southern part of the village where the houses were not as damaged. It was one of the only few not boarded up and the door was partially open, making it seem like the only somewhat welcome house in the village. Even so he felt it was only polite to give the door a gentle knock before he pushed the door open and entered. It was surprisingly homely inside, a complete change to the miserable atmosphere outside, although the house still carried with it an aura of loneliness and loss. There was a wooden table in the middle of the room with chairs around it, and even a vase of small flowers. A wooden floor creaked beneath his boots as he walked in, alerting their presence to the couple that were also standing in the middle of the room. They were an elderly couple, not incredibly old, but old enough to show their years as patches of grey began to appear in their dark hair. Their faces were a lot more wrinkled than they should have been, brought on by the days of frowning with little to smile about. There were very few people who had not been affected by the explosion of the Mako reactor. The woman barely noticed Cloud and the others enter as she sat on one of the chairs, adjusting the flowers in the vase, but the man glanced over at them and looked them over. You a traveler? He asked, although his tone didn't sound like he really cared. He eyed them over one by one, until his eyes fell on Cloud's face and he finally began to look like he cared. Hey, wait, that glare in your eye. You and soldier. The mention of soldier made the woman, his wife, drop the flower she was holding onto the table. She got up hastily out of her chair and looked at Cloud, a flash of sudden hope appearing in her old, worn face. Cloud felt a little uncomfortable as he felt her eager gaze on him, staring at the faint glow in his eyes. Oh, you're right. The woman said, and her face creased up into a smile. 
she walked over to Cloud and stood right in front of him. She was a good few inches shorter than he was, but he still felt a little intimidated by her eagerness. Don't you know anything about our son? His name is Zack, the man added. It's been about ten years since he left for the city, saying he didn't want to live in the country. The woman said, standing by her husband again. He left saying he's going to join Soldier. You ever hear of a Zack in Soldier? The old man put his arm around his wife and they looked at Cloud hopefully. It was clear that the worry of their missing son surpassed the misery that filled Gongaga, and why they looked so old for their years. Seeing someone from Soldier had clearly filled them with sudden hope, and they eagerly awaited Cloud's answer. Cloud thought silently for a moment. He didn't really know what to tell them. Anything he said would surely make them even more worried, and as far as he could remember the name Zack didn't ring any immediate bells. He didn't know everyone who had been in Soldier, and if he had left ten years ago, there could surely be no way he would remember anyone. Also, if ten years had gone by since he left, Zack could be anywhere in the world by now. Hmm? I don't know, he answered finally, although it pained him a little to say it. As he had feared, the hopeful gazes of Zack's parents died right then and there. Their hopeful smiles were replaced once again by ten years' worth of frowns and miseries, making them look frail and old again. A tear filled the old woman's eye, and couldn't raise a smile as her husband gave her a comforting pat on the shoulder. Eris was standing behind Cloud right then, standing silently with her head tilted to the floor and her long brown hair falling around her face and hiding her eyes. She could feel the same misery that the old couple were feeling, and as she watched her feet began to shuffle across the ground. Zack! She mumbled quietly, barely audible, although in the silence of the house it could just about be heard. Young lady, you know him. Eris looked up and gasped, surprised that she had been heard. She looked up to see the gazes of the two parents now turned on her, the faint glimmer of hope slowly returning in their eyes. They were willing to hold on to any hope of recognition, desperate to hold on to some belief that their son was out there somewhere. Even though the chance was it was a very vain hope, there was no harm holding on to it. I remember he wrote to us six or seven years ago saying that he had a girlfriend, said the old woman. Could that have been you? Eris stared, her mouth slightly open. Suddenly, she shook her head fiercely and spoke more harshly than she had intended to. That can't, she said. She suddenly turned away and brushed rudely past the others, desperate to get outside into the fresh air again, away from the house. Cloud and the other stared at her, surprised at Eris's sudden change in behavior. Everyone that is, apart from Tifa. Tifa had also become very quiet and somber as the conversation continued, and could understand why Eris had been so suddenly desperate to get outside. She was beginning to feel the same. The room seemed to be closing in on her and choking her. The whole atmosphere was. Zack? She whispered, before she also turned and headed out of the door, leaving the others in total shock. What happened to you two? Cloud asked, surprised by the two girls' change in behavior. He also went outside, leaving the others inside with the parents of the missing boy. He shut the door behind him and leaned against it, feeling strangely relieved to be out of the house. The sadness that filled the house and the village was overwhelming, more powerful than the sadness that filled the slums of Midgar and even Karel. It was making his heart pound, but he couldn't figure out why. Zack, he muttered to himself, letting the words sound on his tongue and vibrate in the air. There was a strange feeling of familiarity as he said the word. Zack. I don't know anything about the man. But that name sounds so familiar. Why? In frustration, he pushed himself away from the door and kicked a nearby stone, sending it flying into the wall of another nearby house, one that was boarded up and empty. Cloud stared. He was a little surprised at himself for reacting like that, especially since he was sure that he didn't know Zack. Still, it troubled him somewhat, for he couldn't place the familiarity. Maybe he had heard the name before in passing. Either way it wasn't important now. What was important was finding Eris and Tifa, and finding out why they had reacted the way they did. He found Tifa around the corner, standing beside another empty house. She looked rather agitated and was playing with her hair, tugging the dark lengths that surrounded her face as she moved from foot to foot, unsure of how to stand. She was also talking quietly to herself and didn't notice Cloud walking up behind her, not even when he stopped directly behind. Zack! He heard her whisper. Do you know him? 
Tifa jumped about half a meter into the air and turned sharply, clearly very surprised to see Cloud standing there. For a second she placed her hand over her mouth as though to stop her from talking, before she recovered and glared back at Cloud almost angrily, her fists tightly clenched by her side. And, no, I don't know him. She said, her voice carrying a very obvious stammer as she struggled to speak. Cloud tilted his head and looked at her. As well as finding it difficult to speak, Tifa was also shaking slightly, despite how hard she tried to hide it. Her fists were clenched tightly but they were shaking against her thighs. Tifa's face was also quite pale, as though something had really frightened her, and she was finding it extremely difficult to regain control over it. Your face tells me differently, Cloud said. He crossed his arms in front of him, waiting for Tifa's explanation. I told you, I don't. Tifa snapped back in reply, stamping her foot hard on the ground and making the rock beneath her crumble. Cloud stepped back and held out his palms. Eh, hey, all right, he said, giving in. Although he was a little surprised at Tifa's sudden defensive behavior. She had never snapped at anyone like that before. Tifa seemed surprised by it herself. She felt her face begin to flush red and she quickly turned away, not wanting Cloud to see her blush. She also didn't want him to see the tear that had filled her eye and was fighting to roll down her right cheek. She didn't want him to see her act so weak over one little thing. That sounds just like you, she said suddenly. Her voice was still choking a little, but her shaking was gradually falling back under her control. Leaving home, and saying I'm joining soldier. Cloud stared at her, and his eyes softened as he realized why Tifa was acting so strange. He had done the same. Completely out of the blue, without any warning, he had made the same decision to go to Midgar and join Soldier. He had left behind his friends and his family. For all any of them knew they might never have seen him again, either. He figured that prospect had scared Tifa. There were a lot of guys like that back then, he said to her. Tifa slowly nodded her head, and wiped the annoying tear away as it slipped out of her lid and onto her cheek, before it fell too far. Then she turned back to Cloud and looked at him. Although it was clear she had been forcing herself not to cry, she managed a faint smile at him. You must really be something to make it in soldier out of a group like that, she said to him. I really respect you. Nervously, Cloud scratched the back of his head. I worked hard for it, he replied. Hard work pays off, hey? Tifa assumed. She walked past Cloud and looked as though she was heading back to the old couple's house where the others still were. As she passed Cloud she suddenly stopped and looked back at him, the smile on her face wider and more genuine. Cloud, thanks for caring. She then ran off towards the house, returning to her energetic self again. Cloud watched as she ran back to the house. He couldn't help feeling relieved that Tifa was returning to normal. She was not the type of person to show any weakness, and although he often knew what she was thinking, he didn't realize this. Still, she seemed to be fine after a little encouragement, and that left only Eris to find. Eris was a little further into the town, looking out at the ruined reactor in the distance. At least, that was what she appeared to be doing. In reality she was just staring into the space ahead of her, trying to ignore everything that was going on. She did notice Cloud walking up to her and glanced at him for a second, before she turned away again and looked back at the town. What a shock! She said as Cloud approached, loud enough for him to hear. I didn't know Zack was from this town. You know him. Cloud asked, standing beside her. Slowly Eris nodded her head and moved some of her hair away from her face. Didn't I tell you? She asked him. He was my first love. Cloud had to think for a second before he finally remembered what she was talking about. It had been when they first met, when they were sitting together on top of the mog-shaped slide in the Sector 6 abandoned playground. It had been soon after Eris he had once been in Soldier, for it reminded her of her boyfriend and the fact that he had been in Soldier as well. She had never told him the name of her boyfriend, but now it became clear. It was Zack. Cloud muttered silently. He didn't know what to say. It was no wonder that Eris had reacted the way she did as well. It must be hard for her, to stumble across the hometown of her first love, only to find that his parents were also waiting for him to return. He didn't know what Eris must have been feeling, having Zack's parents quiz her about being their son's girlfriend. It probably felt the same as when Cloud had talked about his own family, and how they were no longer around. Zack? Eris said, sighing heavily. 
Soldier first class. Same as Cloud. Strange, there aren't that many who make first class, Cloud said to her. But I've never heard of him. That's all right, Eris replied. She moved her hair out of her eyes again and turned back to Cloud, giving him a slightly cheery smile. It's all in the past. I was just worried because I heard he's been missing. Missing. Eris nodded, now running her fingers through the long strips of hair against her shoulders. I think it was five years ago, she explained. He went out on a job, and never came back. He loved women, a real ladies' man. He probably found someone else. She looked up suddenly as she realized that Cloud was no longer looking at her, instead looking at the ground with a rather grave expression on his face. Hey? What's wrong? She asked, sounding concerned. Poor guy, Cloud said quietly. Eris tilted her head and looked at him, wondering whether he was concerned over Zack's disappearance, or the fact that he had left Eris without saying a single word. I don't really mind that I haven't heard from him, Eris assured him. But I feel for his parents. She put her hand on Cloud's wrist and leaned over to look into Cloud's eyes. Let's go, Cloud. Looking back at her, Cloud slowly nodded his head. Gongaga was a place with too many painful memories for everyone, and it was also clear that Sephiroth had been nowhere near this little village. It was probably best that they left the town behind and prayed that it found some glimmer of happiness at some point in the future. The ruined reactor looked even worse as Cloud approached the reactor. There was wreckage all around the reactor and its small towers, the metal still charred and with thick layers of dark rust beginning to form across its surface. Although nature was finally beginning to win over the reactor, the land around it was still dark and dead. It would still be many more years before grass began to grow around it again. Cloud had gone alone to the reactor, wanting to at least check it out before they moved on and left Gongaga in peace. Ruined reactors were often prime places for finding stray bits of materia of all kinds, and he wondered if there would be anything they could use for their journey. They already had a prime collection of magic and summon materia, including the ones Yuffie had stolen along the way, but it could never hurt to gain more powerful materia. It was deadly silent around the reactor. There were no monsters, which surprised him a little. Monsters loved to breed in ruined places where they could hide their young, but there were none in sight. Like the rest of Gongaga and the forests that surrounded it, they were silent and almost lifeless. He stopped at the entrance and looked inside. Ahead of him was a dark path that led right up into the main part of the reactor. This was where the explosion had occurred. The metal had melted in many places and the doors had been blown apart, and the ground became darker as it was burnt away. Cloud went right up to this main part of the reactor and looked at the broken doors and charred insides. A ruined reactor, he said. He wasn't surprised that Shinra hadn't cleaned up the reactor and rebuilt it. Like Corel, they tended to disregard anything that was damaging to them. He bet they blamed the explosion on the people of Gongaga, and left them to clean up the mess. As Cloud stood there looking at the wreckage of the Mako reactor, a faint sound caught his attention. He turned around and looked back down the path, just as the noise grew louder and the source of the noise came into view. It was a helicopter, flying rapidly over Gongaga and heading swiftly towards the reactor. Although it was still too far away for Cloud to see whom the helicopter was carrying, he could see the infamous Shinra logo painted on the side of the doors. The chopper flew all the way up to the entrance of the reactor and began to descend, unable to go any further because there was no room. Cloud remained where he was, wanting to see who was in the helicopter. As the helicopter landed the doors opened, the blades still whirring as two passengers stepped out from the back of the helicopter. The first was Scarlet, stepping down from the chopper in her high red shoes and onto the ground, a look of disgust on her face, as she smelt the scent of rusty metal all around her. Behind her came Tseng, the leader of the Turks. Scarlet looked over at him and nodded, before they headed on up the path towards the spot where Cloud was. It's Scarlet, head of Shinra Weapon Development, Cloud whispered to himself. He watched for a few seconds more, before he turned and ran quickly round the side of the reactor, wanting to get out of sight before Scarlet and Seng could spot him. He hid behind a large chunk of broken metal and peered out. He saw Scarlet march firmly into the reactor zone and head towards the broken doors that once shielded the reactor's interior. Seng stopped a few meters back, looking around for any signs of trouble, since he had probably heard from Elena, Reno, or Rude that Cloud and his gang were in the area. So he kept a sharp lookout as Scarlet looked through the doors of the reactor, peering through the darkness. A few seconds later, Scarlet retracted her head and shook her head fiercely. Humph! This isn't any good either! She huffed angrily, 
her blonde hair swaying around her face. You only get junky materia from junky reactors. She gave the side of the reactor a sharp kick with her heel, and walked back to Tseng. This reactor's a failure. She snapped at him. What I'm looking for is big, large, huge materia. You seen any? Tseng thought for a moment, before shaking his head sorrowfully. No, I haven't seen it, he said, cautious not to arouse Scarlet's fierce temper, which could rise at the slightest little thing. I'll get on it right away. Please, said Scarlet, who thankfully didn't sound as angry as she would normally have been. We could make the ultimate weapon if only we had some. Cloud's ears pricked up at the words ultimate weapon, and he leaned in a little closer to hear more of what Scarlet was saying, whilst being careful not to make himself visible. I just can't wait, Tseng replied. With Hojo gone, the weapon development's been getting a bigger budget, said Scarlet. I envy them. But, Scarlet added, suddenly looking rather thoughtful. Even if we make the perfect weapon, could that stupid Heidegger even use it? Tseng didn't reply, and simply looked away from Scarlet and towards the floor. Scarlet looked at him in bewilderment for a second, before her mind clicked and she realized why Tseng was looking away. Oh. Sorry. She exclaimed in mock sincerity. I forgot Heidegger was your boss. Ha ha ha. Again Tseng said nothing, and simply waited until Scarlet had finished her laughter, almost in hysterics at her own non-existent witticism. When she finished she took a deep breath and fanned herself softly with her hand to cool herself down. Then she turned back to Tseng, forcing the smile away as she grew serious once again, the novelty of the joke over. Let's go, she said sharply, and brushed past Tseng to head back to the helicopter. Tseng followed her in silence, refusing to say a word. Once they were out of sight, Cloud stepped out from behind the fallen metal and went back to the reactor door. He could just see Scarlet marching off ahead of Tseng as she went back to the chopper, calling out rudely to the pilot to open the doors for her and to help her in. Big, large, huge materia. Cloud asked aloud, his voice quiet against the loud whirring of chopper blades. An ultimate weapon? The perfect weapon? Just what are the Shinra up to? He took a step back away from the reactor as the helicopter doors closed, and the chop began to rise in the air. Once airborne, the helicopter turned around and headed off the way it came, disappearing over the trees of the forest again until it disappeared into the distance, allowing Cloud to move out of hiding again. Standing in the middle of the abandoned reactor for a minute, Cloud crossed his arms and tapped his foot against the floor, thinking hard. What was this weapon that Scarlet was so keen to create, and why did she need huge materia to create it? Huge materia? The term rung a small bell in Cloud's mind, but he didn't think it was important right then. What bothered him was the Shinra, and whatever it was that they were planning alongside their search for Sephiroth and the Promised Land. While he was thinking, he found himself moving towards the open reactor doors. It was very dark inside the reactor, and Cloud had to push himself up on the sharp edges of the doors to fully see inside. There, through the darkness, was a small, sharp glint of red light. There's something shiny back there. Cloud said. Pushing himself up further, whilst being careful not to fall and cut himself on the sharp edges of the doors as they stuck up around him, Cloud leaned in and stuck his hand into the darkness. He fumbled around through the shadows for a minute, until his hand closed around the familiarly firm and smooth surface of a materia ball. It came free easily, and Cloud pulled it out. He sighed with relief as he saw it was another summoned materia ball, this one he recognized quite easily. The image contained inside like a locked picture, a bare-chested warrior with strong muscles, it could only be Titan Materia. Although a fairly rare form of summon Materia, it was often used in soldier for field-based combat. He put it safely in his pocket, with the plan to adjust it into his collection later. With all that over and done with, Cloud began to head back towards Gongaga. He spared one last glance at the reactor that had caused so much misery for the village, before he turned away and walked on without looking back. End of chapter. Episode 3, Part 05, Chapter 03. Chapter 3 Everyone was extremely relieved when Cloud returned from the reactor and they could finally leave the village of Gongaga. The misery that enveloped the town was unreal, and everyone they had spoken to had a tale to tell about the tragedy that hit them and took so many lives and ruined others. Friends, family, every single person in Gongaga had lost somebody close to them. By the time they emerged from the forest and climbed back into the buggy, they had all been affected by it as well. Gongaga, like Karel, was another town that had had sorrowful dealings with the Shinra, 
and it became clearer than ever that the Shinra was to blame for most of the pain in the world. As they drove on away from the forest they began to head towards the west, beginning their route round to the other end of the continent. In an attempt to distract themselves from the memories of Gongaga and Karel, and the fact that there may be a spy amongst their group, they focused their attention on other things, such as sorting out the collection of materia they had gained so far. So while Eris drove on, after insisting that she drive the buggy across the plains, Cloud and others sat in the back of the buggy and laid out all the materia they had collected. Only Yuffie refused to give up her materia, but no one bothered to force it out of her. Since the money incident at the gold saucer Yuffie had become even more uptight about sharing her belongings, although she eyed the rest of the material with hungry eyes. Hands off, Tifa snapped harshly as she saw Yuffie's hand edging towards one of the many summon materia balls they had collected during their journey. Yuffie looked at her before she moved towards the back of the buggy and pulled her knees up close to her chest, looking away moodily. As she sat there with a frown on her face, Tifa glanced over at Cloud, who rolled his eyes and shook his head. There's no point arguing, Cloud said simply. He turned back down to the materia. Anyway, I think it best if we try and split the materia equally amongst us. Each person has a summon, support, offensive. One problem, Tifa pointed out. She reached out and picked up one of the green balls. We have only one restorative between us. That's not going to be much help if we get split up and someone gets hurt. No worries, said Cloud. If we come across a place that sells, we can always buy more. Besides, he said as he took the ball from Tifa and looked into its lightly glowing green center. If we keep using it like we have, it'll probably develop on its own. Then we won't have to buy any. Tifa nodded, and everyone watched as Cloud began to divide the materia between them all. There was more than enough for everyone, and everyone was able to get some sort of offensive materia to add to their weapons. There were only five balls of summon materia between the seven of them, but no one was worried about that. If they kept finding materia like they were doing, there would be plenty for everyone eventually and they would all have summons of their own. Once he was done the others picked up their divided materia and equipped it into their weapons and armor. At last their materia was equally divided and sorted. With all that done the buggy drove on across the countryside, passing close to the perimeter of another larger forest that grew alongside the tall, rocky mountains that rose all around the center of the continent. On the other side of the buggy they could see the shoreline in the distance, as well as the distant sea. If they were to head further south it would take them another hour to reach the ocean, but they had no time to waste right then. Enough time had been lost getting out of the gold saucer, and with no sign of Sephiroth anywhere, they had to use all their time trying to catch up with him before the Shinra did. About twenty minutes after they finished sorting out the materia they had to turn north and drive right around the perimeter of the forest. The end of the continent sharply turned north and ran close to the edge of the forest, forcing them north towards the river where the ocean water flowed in and was dispersed around the rest of the continent. Driving across the river and up into the next part of the continent was no problem at all, but the next problem was still to come. Now they were on the next part of the continent they were right up close to the mountain range, and the only way they could continue on would be to drive right through the mountains. Although there was a path that they could use leading into the range, it was very rough and jagged, with many bumps and curves and sharp bits of rock sticking up out of the ground. Eris slowed the buggy until it stopped at the entrance of the range, and they all got out. I don't think we can drive through that, Eris said. It looks a little rough. Does this mean we'll have to abandon the buggy? Asked Tifa. She turned and looked over to Cloud. He was standing ahead of the group his arms folded, eyes scanning the mountains as he summed up their options. He didn't look particularly keen on the prospect of abandoning the buggy, either. Because of the buggy they had been able to pick up on a lot of the time they had lost, and they would be more likely to catch up with Sephiroth in the buggy rather than on foot. That will not be necessary, Red 13 said suddenly, and everyone turned to him. He nodded his head and bounded forward towards the entrance of the mountain path, where he turned back to the others. I know this area well. The mountains are rough to travel through, but there are sufficient places for the buggy to ride without being damaged severely. Are you sure? Cloud asked him. Red 13 nodded his head confidently. I am positive, he replied, looking directly into Cloud's eyes. Then he turned to Eris. Do not worry. I will guide you through. And guide them through he did. As they set off again through the mountain range and across the precarious mountain path, Red 13 showed them every safe twist and turn so the buggy avoided all the major ditches and rises in the ground that would damage the buggy and leave them stranded again. Running alongside of the buggy, Red 13 was glad to be out of the cramped buggy and stretching his legs. He certainly did know the area well. 
as he led them on the path moved further up into the mountains, carrying them far away from the ocean and into the rocky mountains. Red 13 guided them on step by step throughout the jagged mountain path without faltering even once. Although the buggy did occasionally bounce up and down on the rocks, there was nothing so extreme that would damage the buggy, and leave them to climb the mountains on foot. Cosmo Canyon They soon came across their next destination, Surprising Cloud and the others but not Surprising Red 13. In fact, he even deliberately swerved around and motioned for Eris to drive the buggy after him, heading towards the rather strange-looking set of structures ahead of them. The strange sight ahead of them was actually a village of sorts, and was built alongside one of the tall walls of the rising mountain. It spread across a fairly large area of flat space that must have been carved artificially, although there were no signs of machinery or anything mechanical. There were a fair number of huts scattered around, built of strong wood that could withstand the rain and other extreme weather conditions, and roofs made of thick pliable green wood, smoothed down to perfection so the rain would slide off with no damage to the structure. The majority of huts were built against the mountain wall, while others were built up on wide ledges higher up the wall, accessible by long wooden ladders. Some houses were even built inside the mountain itself, carved into the mountain wall and only visible by small wooden doors leading inside the wall. It seemed impossible that such a natural-looking town could have no form of machinery. The houses and shops that were built inside the mountain wall could only have been made by machinery, but as Cloud and the others approached in their buggy they could see absolutely nothing. There was also no sign of a Mako reactor, which was another good sign. Red 13 picked up speed and ran on ahead of the others, stopping at the bottom of a long set of stairs that were carved perfectly into the rock leading up into the canyon. He turned back in time to see Eris slow the buggy to a stop a few meters behind him, and the others all piled out. They looked up in awe at the mountain village, for it looked so beautiful from where they were. Secretly grinning at their reactions, Red 13 turned away and began to dart up the rocky stairs, barking at the others to follow him. There was a man standing at the very top of the stairs, leaning against one of the two wooden poles that stood firm and guarded the entrance of the canyon. He was clearly a guard, although he certainly didn't dress like one. He also looked quite bored, staring at the floor with a single leaf stalk twirling in his hand, until he heard a voice calling out to him from the stairs and made him take notice. I am home. It is I, Nanaki. The man looked up and glanced over towards the stairs. Seconds later, his eyes widened in total surprise and a look of recognition spread across his face, followed by a huge smile of happiness and relief as Red 13 bounded over and stopped right in front of him. The hound was almost bouncing on his paws, unable to keep still as he shifted about in front of the guard, completely unlike anything he had acted like before. Hey, Nanaki! He exclaimed, dropping the leaf stalk onto the ground as he walked over and gave the hound a soft pet on his furry head. You're safe. Come on, and say hello to Bugenhagen. Red 13 nodded and complied quickly, running past the guard as he stepped aside to let him through. Cloud and the others had just reached the top of the stairs and stopped as they saw Red 13 run inside the village. They saw him bound up almost excitedly towards more rocky steps that were built alongside the mountain wall, leading to more inner houses. Nanaki! Cloud repeated, confused. Red 13 seems different, doesn't he? said Tifa, whispering in Cloud's ear. Cloud nodded back in reply, and looked up at Red 13. The hound was perched on the top of one of the steps with his head held high, looking up towards the top of the mountain. Cloud looked up, too, and saw what Red 13 was looking at. At the very top of the mountain there was a fairly large tower that also combined as a house. It had a rounded roof and a balcony running around the outside, and was that the tip of a telescope he could see poking out of the top of the roof? There was a large slit in the roof paved over with thick glass, barely visible from the bottom of the mountain, but Cloud could just see the tip of a black oval on the inside. It had to have been a telescope. And here, in the middle of the mountains, far away from any major city, the view of the stars must surely have been incredible. He was broken from his gaze as Tifa nudged his arm, making him remember that they were still standing outside of the village and looking up like an idiot. Cloud fought the flush spreading on his face and hurriedly marched forwards, walking right up to the entrance guard who was waiting for them. Welcome to Cosmo Canyon, he said to them cheerfully, greeting them with a smile that was not as excited as it had been when he saw Red 13. Are you familiar with this land? Cloud glanced around at the others, who slowly shook their heads. No, he answered, turning back to the guard. The guard nodded, understanding. Let me explain, he said. People from all over the world gather here to seek the study of planet life. When he spoke it was almost automatic, as though he had said it many times before. 
he turned away and looked inside the canyon, before he turned back and groaned loudly. Umga! It's full capacity at the moment, so I'm afraid I can't let you enter. As he finished speaking, Red Thirteen came running back down the rocky steps towards the entrance, overhearing what they were saying. They helped me when I was on the road, he said to the guard. Please let them in. He then turned and ran off again, leaving the guard to consider his words. He turned back to Cloud and the others and looked them up and down, eyeing up their weapons and armor. Oh, is that so? He asked. You helped our Nanaki. He tapped his foot for a moment, before he finally made up his mind and stepped out of the way of the door. Please, come in. Who is Nanaki? Cloud asked, confused. The guard also looked confused. Nanaki is Nanaki, he said, speaking as though it was the most obvious answer in the world. That's his name. With the entrance clear, Cloud and the others all walked slowly into the village known as Cosmo Canyon. They looked around with great interest, for Cosmo Canyon was one of the most spectacular places they had ever seen. There was even a small fire in the center of the canyon, for where people would gather and talk about the things they had seen in the village. In contrast, Cosmo Canyon was the total opposite of Midgar. Midgar was a city built entirely of metal, surrounded by dead land that was growing darker and more dead as the days went by. Cosmo Canyon was on the other end of the spectrum, built entirely from nature without damaging the surrounding land, and the land around it, although rocky, was still filled with life. The people they could see walking around looked happy, a change from the miserable faces they had seen in places like Karel and Gongaga. Red 13 was waiting for them halfway up the first set of stairs. He certainly did seem different now that they were in Cosmo Canyon, although most of his almost childlike excitement had died down now. He was still finding it difficult to keep still, however, even when he sat back on his haunches and tried to keep his legs firmly still. Here is where I was. I mean... This is my hometown, Red Thirteen said. He could barely even speak properly. My tribe were protectors of those who appreciated this beautiful canyon and the planet. My brave mother fought and died here, but my cowardly father left her. He raised his head and looked up the sky, which was growing dark rapidly. I am the last of my race. Cowardly father? Asked Cloud. Red Thirteen lowered his head and looked at the ground. He suddenly seemed almost ashamed, but at least his excited quivering had ended now. Yes, he said finally, his voice quiet. My father was a wastrel. And so the mission I inherited from my ancestors, is to protect this place. My journey ends here. Hey. Nanaki. You're home. The hound's eyes lit up brightly at the sound of the voice calling out to him from somewhere above them. Red 13 jumped to his feet, his tail straight and firm behind him, and looked up to the top of the mountain. Coming, Grandpa. He called, before he turned away from the others and ran off up the steps, turning to run up another set until he disappeared through an open door leading inside the mountain wall. He left the others feeling a little shocked, although really they should have been expected it. Red 13, or Nanaki, as he was known in Cosmo Canyon, had said when they escaped from Midgar that he would leave them once he returned to his hometown. And Cosmo Canyon was his home, so it was only natural that he would leave them at this point. It still came as a bit of a shock, especially after traveling with them for so long. Let's rest for a bit, said Eris suddenly, and everyone turned to look at her. She shrugged. There are some things I want to find out about anyway. Cloud slowly nodded his head, and everyone sighed heavily. After the hours of driving and being cramped up in the back of the buggy, everyone was relieved to have a bit of a break. The night sky was falling in fast now, and surely within the hour it would be completely dark, and no one wanted to sleep in a cramped buggy, even if the night sky did look nice. So as Red Thirteen went off to find his grandfather, the rest of the group parted ways and went off to explore the mountain village of Cosmo Canyon on their own. At this particular time the village was quiet and there were not many people walking around, although the campfire in the center of the village still burned strongly. As the others went off to explore different parts of the canyon on their own, Cloud just sat down on the rocky stairs outside the main part of the canyon in silence. He unhooked his sword from his back and laid it out on the steps beside him. The large silver blade glinted a little, the two balls of lightning and elemental materia shining only slightly with the coming night. Seeing their sparkle, Cloud turned his gaze up towards the sky. It was another clear night, and the first bright stars were just becoming visible. Pretty soon they would all be out, along with all the other sights that could only be visible in the country. He couldn't believe that only a day had gone by, and they had traveled so far. He had expected it to take a day or two at the least to get so far, but thanks to the buggy the trip had been much faster. 
as Cloud sat there looking up at the sky, a faint sound hit his ears. It was the faint sound of music, drums, and string guitars, and was that a flute? He couldn't see the musicians, but the music was clear and could be heard throughout the canyon. He couldn't see any of the others either, although he was positive that they could hear the music, too. Picking up his sword and placing it back on his back, Cloud stood up and headed up the steps towards the inner part of the canyon, wanting to know for certain if Red 13 was planning to leave them. There were more people inside the canyon than outside, but with night approaching it was much quieter than it would have been during the day. There were shops and houses all carved inside the mountain, although they all seemed homely enough. The majority of the people wandering around were coming from one of the back rooms on the first floor, which Cloud presumed from a quick peek in that it must have been a library of sorts. As Cloud headed up to the second floor he thought he saw Yuffie slinking into one of the shops. He presumed it must have been the Materia shop, for she had a superior look of smugness on her face. Instead of following her to see if she was up to her sneaky pinching tricks again, he tried hard to pretend he never saw her and carried on looking around. There was a young kid standing ahead of him, looking up at a metal door that was peculiarly built at the end of the hall, along with a strange machine that looked somewhat like a scanner. With the exception of the observatory on the top of the mountain, this was the first sign of anything artificial throughout the canyon. The kid seemed enthralled by it, standing up on his tiptoes to try and see the scanner. It seemed as though Red 13 wasn't on this floor either, and with the only exit leading out to small viewing balcony, there was only a ladder left for Cloud to climb. The ladder led to the very top of the mountain, where a thin tunnel had been carved as the only way out. Cloud climbed out of the tunnel slowly, careful not to catch his sword on any loose bits of rock from the tunnel. When he climbed out he looked around, and was surprised by what he saw. There was a house built on top of the mountain, with the tall, cylindrical observatory built alongside and joining onto it. He was also surprised by the amount of technological equipment there was lying around, it was almost hard to believe that he was in the same place. As Cloud looked around, he saw that the lights were on in the main house and the door was ajar. He could just about hear voices talking inside, one of them he recognized as Red 13. Or did he want to be called Nanaki from now on? Cloud shook his head, confused. That was a problem that could be sorted out later. For now, he just walked up to the door and slowly peered around it. It was a quaint little house, and there was more signs of electrical equipment inside as well. He saw Red 13 standing ahead of him, talking to an elderly man who was standing by the table. He was a rather peculiar looking man, with a bald head and white beard, his body covered up by a long blue cloak that hung over his hands and his feet. His face was old but definitely kind, and many wrinkles appeared on his forehead and around his mouth as he smiled at Red 13. What was most peculiar was that the man's feet didn't seem to be touching the ground, the cloak that covered his feet just stopped a good few inches away from the ground. It was as though he was floating, but from what Cloud had seen so far he figured it was another electrical device of some kind. After all, the old guy couldn't really be floating by himself. Could he? Hearing the door creak open, Red 13 turned and saw Cloud standing in the doorway. There was definitely an almost childlike smile on his face, which looked very odd on the hound. Cloud, the hound said, motioning to Cloud to come in further. This is my grandfather, Bugenhagen. He is incredible. He knows everything. Cloud walked further into the room, shutting the door behind him and looking around. There were many strange things inside the strange house, with a ladder going up towards the observatory, and another metal door at the side, although it looked to be locked. Ho ho ho, Bugenhagen laughed cheerfully, making Cloud jump a little. He had a rather jolly voice, although it carried a faint hint of seriousness as well. I hear that you looked after Nanaki a bit. Nanaki's still a child you see. Please stop, Grandfather, Red 13 said, looking down. I'm 48. Ho ho ho, Bugenhagen said again, laughing in his weird but surprisingly jolly way. He saw Cloud looking confused, and slowly nodded his head. Nanaki's tribe have incredible longevity. He explained. So you see his 48 years would only be equivalent to say that of a 15 or 16 year old in human reckoning. Cloud jumped back violently, his eyes opening wide in complete astonishment. 15 or 16? He exclaimed. He stared intently at Red 13, who was flushing slightly. He had always though of Red 13 as the oldest of them or at least near Barrett's age, but to be the equivalent of a 15 or 16 year old meant he was closer to Yuffie's age in comparison. He had never guessed, and probably would never have thought that without being told directly. He's quiet and very deep, said Bugenhagen. You thought he was an adult. Red 13 lowered his head and looked at the ground sheepishly, seeming rather embarrassed to have his true age revealed. Grandfather. 
I want to be an adult. He said. I want to grow up to be able to protect you and the village. Ho ho ho. No Nanaki. Said the old man, suddenly sounding a little bit more serious despite his laugh. You can't stand on your own yet. To do that now would destroy you in the long run. He looked upwards and raised his arms towards the ceiling. Reaching up into the heavens, threatening to snatch the very stars from the city of Midgar. You've seen it, haven't you? Well, that's a bad example. Looking up too much makes you lose perspective. He suddenly floated upwards, making Cloud stare in even more surprise as he moved without walking and stopped above the table. He very nearly leant over to see if there was a device making him float, but he was too entranced to move. Bugenhagen was definitely a very peculiar man indeed. When it's time for this planet to die, you'll understand that you knew absolutely nothing, Bugenhagen added as Cloud stood there. When the planet dies? asked Cloud. He found himself tilting his head slightly, completely baffled by the old man's ability to float. He couldn't hear any machinery beneath his long cloak, so how could he be floating? Ho ho ho! It may be tomorrow, or one hundred years from now. But it's not long off. He replied, stroking his beard softly. How do you know this? Cloud said. I hear the cries of the planet, Bugenhagen told him. Cloud was about to ask what he meant when a strange sound suddenly echoed throughout the house. It was similar to the sound of a gushing wind blowing all around them, although there was no wind blowing inside the house at all. Cloud looked up and around to see what was making the sound, but he couldn't find the source. He was sure the sound came from somewhere upstairs, but it was as clear here as it would be up there. What's that? He asked. The sounds of the stars in the heavens, Bugenhagen replied. He was also looking up, his eyes closed as he listened to the whirlwind sound blowing around him. He almost looked entranced. While this goes on, planets are born, and die. At that moment another sound joined in the echoes of the wind, a less pleasant sound that made Cloud step back and sent a cold chill straight down his spine and made him shiver. It sounded almost like a scream, a painful, anguished scream of a thousand peculiar voices wailing madly. The scream seemed to vibrate all around them, off every wall and through every nook and cranny, clutching at the hearts of Cloud, Red Thirteen and Bugenhagen as they stood and listened to its cry. What was that? Cloud asked. He was surprised to find his voice shaking a little. Something about the strange cry had shaken his soul hard, and he could almost feel his soul wanting to cry along with it. Ho ho ho! That was a scream from this planet! Replied Bugenhagen. Didn't you hear it? As if to say, I hurt, I suffer. Cloud slowly put his palm flat against his chest, feeling the mad beat of his heart as it pounded away inside of him. He could hear the cry, and even as it died down around them he could still hear its echoes in his mind. If that was a scream from the planet then it truly was in pain. He looked up at Bugenhagen, who was looking down with a look of sudden sympathy on his face. Sympathy and sorrow for the planet. They have come here on a journey to save the planet, said Red Thirteen. Why don't you show them your apparatus? Ho ho ho, Bugenhagen laughed as he floated slowly off the table to rejoin them on the ground. To save the planet? Ho ho ho. But, then again, I guess it wouldn't hurt to show him. Again Cloud was about to as a question about what Red Thirteen and Bugenhagen were talking about, when the door behind them suddenly flew open and a man ran hurriedly into the room. He looked very anxious and nervous, Cloud noticed, panting hard as though he had run all the way up to Bugenhagen's house. Bugenhagen! The man exclaimed. Several odd-looking people have come. The whole place has gotten busy all of a sudden, said Bugenhagen. He brought friends too, Red Thirteen said, looking up at the old man. I'll go get them. He began to walk off slowly across the floor, past the panting guard, when he suddenly stopped and turned back to Cloud. Cloud, please call one of them. Only three people can fit into Grandfather's machine. Cloud crossed his arms and thought for a moment. If he could only take one person into the machine, it would probably be best if it were Eris. As an ancient, she was connected to the planet anyway, although she hadn't said much about the planet talking to her since they left Midgar. She would probably be most interested in whatever it was Bugenhagen planned on showing them. Whatever it was. End of chapter. Episode 4, Part 05, Chapter 04. Chapter 4. 
Upon leaving Bugenhagen's house, Cloud and Red 13 split and head back into town. Red 13 ran off to search through the main part of the canyon for the others, while Cloud headed out to the lower parts of the canyon in search of Eris. He found her eventually, sitting in the village and with Tifa as they sat and talked about all the things they had seen in the canyon. They greeted Cloud warmly, and Cloud immediately told Eris about the apparatus that Bugenhagen wanted to show them. After telling her it might have something to do with the planet she had jumped up instantly, excited at the prospect of learning something new about the planet. Bugenhagen was not in the main room of his house when they returned, although the front door had been left open. There was no sign of Red 13 either, but that was no surprise since he was probably still out looking for the others as they wandered through the village. Eris looked at Cloud, who shrugged dismissively. Where could Bugenhagen have gone? Here, over here. The door's unlocked, come on in. Cloud and Eris both jumped, startled, and turned sharply towards the metal door that Cloud had observed earlier. Although locked before, the door was open now, the metal latch hanging loosely at the side and slightly ajar to reveal a faint line of light coming from the inside. This was where Bugenhagen's voice was coming from, so Cloud and Eris both pushed open the door and went inside. The hidden room beyond was a fairly large room, and filled with even more technological stuff that neither Cloud nor Eris could identify. Machines of all kinds lay on all sides of the circular room, disused for many years although clearly still in good condition. It told them a little more about Bugenhagen at least, and that his interests lay in both nature and in science. Bugenhagen was standing, or rather, floating still, at the far end of the room beside a strange machine with a huge lever rising up out of it. Many wires were sticking out at the bottom of this machine, all of them attached to a peculiar-looking platform in the middle of the room. Also rounded, the platform was glowing very faintly as power from the wires slowly flooded into it. Ho ho ho, Bugenhagen said, his beard quivering as he laughed and looked at Cloud and Eris. It looks like you have them all together. Then let's begin. Go and stand over there. Cloud nodded and began to head over towards the platform, before he realized that Eris wasn't following. Turning back to her he saw that she was staring open-mouthed at Bugenhagen, in particular at the way he was floating many inches off the ground with one hand on the handle. Cloud leaned over and gave her a nudge on the arm. This seemed to break her from her stare and she looked at Cloud, and then back at Bugenhagen. Evidently, she had not believed Cloud when he told her about Bugenhagen's strange ability to float in the air. Once Eris had recovered from the initial shock, she followed Cloud and stood on the circular platform. Bugenhagen then pulled down the lever he was holding onto, and then quickly moved so that he was standing opposite Cloud and Eris on the platform. A second later the lights in the room suddenly dimmed to an absolute minimum, dying down so that the room was almost enveloped in total darkness. Cloud and Eris looked around blindly for a few seconds until they felt a curious vibration beneath their feet, followed by the loud humming of the machine as it fed more power into the platform. With a gentle shudder the platform came alive and began to rise up off the floor, rising up smoothly away from the floor and up to the ceiling. Looking up, Eris saw that the ceiling above them was curved and made of a peculiar metal seemed to resemble the night sky. At first she thought that the black space and the white stars had been painted on, but as they drew closer to it she saw that the stars were more 3D and seemed to move about slowly across the sky. With another gentle shudder the platform stopped just inside the strange upper dome, and Eris looked around at their new surroundings. It was almost like walking straight into space. The curved sides of the dome surrounded her on all sides, with more stars seeming to hover freely away from the edges, although they couldn't surely have been real. Up above her there was a 3D model of a solar system, with the sun in the middle and planets slowly revolving around it, again of their own free will. Elliptical yellow lines that wound their way around the sun marked the orbit of each planet and the planets moved slowly across them, following their route. So pretty! Eris remarked her voice trembling as she became filled with such awe at the realism of what was around her. It's just like the real thing. Bugenhagen, who had been standing behind her and Cloud until then, moved away from the platform and floated up towards the ring of planets that slowly circled above them. Hmm, yes pretty good, he said, looking around at the space around them. This is my laboratory. All the workings of space are entered into this 3D holographic system. Hey! A shooting star! Eris was standing with her head twisted behind her as she saw a bright yellow-white star fly behind her. Just a small speck from where she was standing, the star had a long tail trailing behind it, leaving tiny specks of stardust in its wake. These specks twinkled brightly for a few seconds, before they faded and merged into the blackness of space. That wasn't all there was to see. Just as the shooting star passed on and disappeared into the distance, a planet with a revolving moon then slowly began to revolve past Eris. 
the young woman looked on, her green eyes wide and staring with intense excitement and curiosity as the planet slowly passed her. It was so close she could almost touch it, but she was afraid to disturb the planet from its slow orbit around the sun. While Eris was busy looking at the planet another large object began to fly over her head. Looking up Eris saw that it was a large meteor covered in craters. She could see these craters clearly and with such detail she could almost picture the asteroids or small meteors that must have crashed into the surface of the meteor, crashing with such force that the ground was forced up around it, creating such beautiful craters. As the meteor spun slowly above her, Eris saw that there were more meteors around her, all of them flowing in the same direction towards the far corner of the laboratory. Looking ahead Eris saw that there was a black hole just a few meters from where she was standing, a gaping hole in the middle of the space surrounded by dim lights, using its powerful sucking force to draw the loose meteorites into it. One by one the meteorites were pulled into its dark center, where they would be crushed and compressed until there was nothing left of them. It truly was an amazing laboratory. Wow, how wonderful, was all Eris could say. Her words were lost as she stared at the black hole, now empty of its meteor cargo, floating silently ahead of her. Ho ho ho! Yes, it is something, isn't it? Bugenhagen said, agreeing with her. Well, let's get to the subject. Eris nodded and finally pulled herself away from the image of the black hole, its sucking force almost drawing her in with its hypnotic swirl. Instead she stood by Cloud, and together they looked up at Bugenhagen turned away from them, waiting for them to settle so he could begin his explanation. Eventually, all humans die, Bugenhagen began. What happens to them after they die? The body decomposes, and returns to the planet. That much everyone knows. What about their consciousness, their hearts, and their souls? He turned back and looked down at Cloud and Eris. His face had lost all its laughter and humor now, and had changed into a very serious expression. Even his voice was no longer laughing. The soul too returns to the planet. And not only those of humans, but everything on this planet. In fact, all living things in the universe, are the same. The spirits that return to the planet, merge with one another and roam the planet. They roam, converge, and divide, becoming a swell, called the life stream. Life stream. In other words, a path of energy of the souls roaming the planet. Spirit energy is a word that you should never forget. A new life. Children are blessed with the spirit energy and are brought into the world. Then, the time comes when they die and once again return to the planet. Of course there are exceptions, but this is the way of the world. Bugenhagen sighed heavily. I've digressed, but you'll understand better if you watch this. Bugenhagen gently floated aside, and motioned for Cloud and Eris to come a little closer. The two complied and walked up close as Bugenhagen held out his hand and pointed to one of the steadily rotating planets that was rolling in steady towards them. It was a rather basic looking planet that had no special features, until they looked a little closer at its surface. There was a man on the planet, or at least a holographic simulation of what they presumed was meant to be a human male, for there were no features on the figure, and he was walking across the surface of the planet. He came to a stop at the top of the globe right next to a single tree that was also sticking up out of the top of the planet. The man stood silently for a second, before he straightened his arms out. Then the man's body suddenly began to dissolve, gradually breaking down into separate components and falling towards the ground. As more and more of him began to disappear, those separate components began to glow and turned into a flow of yellow energy that slowly began to trickle down across the planet's surface. Moments later the tree began to dissolve as well, breaking down into a trail of pink energy that followed the yellow trail down towards the underside of the planet. Cloud and Eris watched in awe as the two colored trails swirled to the bottom of the planet, converging and merging into one colored trail. As they reached the bottom the new single trail began to solidify again, taking on its new form of a newborn baby. Before their eyes the baby grew rapidly until it was back into the same human male form that had previously stood on top of the planet. Then, like before, it dissolved again as it died and turned back into a swirl of yellow energy that began to move slowly across the planet again. By this point more swirls of energy were beginning to flow across the surface of the planet. More trees and miniature people were appearing on all corners of the planet, dispersing into move trails of pink and yellow and other colored energy and swirling across the surface. It wasn't long before the planet was teeming with colored energy, forming a light surface of color that covered the planet. Spirit energy makes all things possible, trees, birds, and humans, said Bugenhagen. He was now floating alongside the colored planet, watching the energy swirl across its surface. Not just living things. But spirit energy makes it possible for planets to be planets. What happens if that energy were to disappear? He raised his hand and held it out in front of the planet. 
as if it were a magnet, the colored swirls of energy began to pull the other way and slowly drift away from the planet's surface, towards Bugenhagen's hand. As the energy moved away and dissolved into the air, the planet began to change. A blanket of darkness began to sweep across its surface, swallowing up all the oceans and grassy lands until the planet was merely a dark ball floating in space. Then, with nothing left alive to hold onto, the planet began to break apart. Its smooth surface cracked open and a giant chunk began to drift off away from it, heading off towards the black hole. Bugenhagen lowered his arm as the planet moved slowly on, a half-broken dead ball. These are the basics in the study of planet life, he finished. Down on the platform, Eris lowered her head and looked at the ground, shifting her feet uncomfortably. After seeing the planet's last few moments, before darkness consumed it and destroyed it, she couldn't help but feel a little bit sad. When Bugenhagen raised his hand, it was as though he sucked out all of the energy and killed the planet himself. She also realized then what Bugenhagen was saying about that, and she quickly turned her head away. Beside her, Cloud folded his arms and tapped his foot, creating a soft echo. If the spirit energy is lost, our planet is destroyed. He assumed. Ho ho ho! Spirit energy is sufficient because it exists within nature. Replied Bugenhagen. When spirit energy is forcefully extracted, and manufactured, it can't accomplish its true purpose. Cloud suddenly stopped tapping his foot on the ground and looked up, staring into Bugenhagen's serious face as he finally realized just what Bugenhagen was saying. You're talking about Mako energy, right? He asked. Bugenhagen slowly nodded his head. Everyday Mako reactors suck up spirit energy, diminishing it. Spirit energy gets compressed in the reactors and processed into Mako energy. All living things are being used up and thrown away. In other words, Mako energy will only destroy the planet. His voice choked a little words the end, his words ringing like a cracked bell through Eris and Cloud. The two of them stood silently, their heads down as they absorbed his words. Eris was still holding onto her staff, and she looked down at the many balls of colored materia she had stored there, and the ball of materia she had in her hair to help keep her hair back. Materia Condensed Mako energy the materia she used was made from the very spirit energy that ran through the heart of their planet. With a small tear forming in her eye she tightened her grip on the staff. She didn't notice when Bugenhagen pulled a small lever that was almost invisible against the side of the dome, and the platform began to head back down into the hidden room. Her fists were shaking slightly as the lights came back on, unable to take her eyes off the materia. The study of the planets and those who lived with them, Bugenhagen was saying as the room brightened up again. You want to know more? Then you must listen to the words of the elders. Cloud nodded and turned towards the door, when he saw that Eris still had her head down and was still staring at the side of her staff where the materia was stored in their special slots. Gently, he took her arm and she looked up at him, her eyes saddened and glistening in the corners where tears were slowly forming. He gave her a nod, and she just managed a brief smile before she hurriedly turned away from him and walked out of the door, almost running. Cloud followed her, leaving Bugenhagen alone in the bottom of his laboratory. Once they were gone, Bugenhagen slowly turned to his machine and pushed the button to turn it off. Circular metal doors began to slide across the underside of the dome, sealing off the planet's structure from view. His face was no longer laughing and he seemed quite troubled, although it was not due to Eris's apparent dismay of the truth of the world. Nanaki! He said aloud, as the humming from the machine died down and the room fell into a deep silence. The light died further, leaving the room in darkness. His father a coward? So that's it. Nanaki's been thinking that all this time. Eris tore out of Bugenhagen's house and ran to the rails that surrounded the house, a safeguard and lookout point for the whole canyon. She let her staff fall onto the floor as she let herself fall against the rails. She was relieved to feel the cool evening wind against her skin, and the deep red sunset was simply beautiful, especially as the orange-red cast shadows on the entire canyon. Seeing that, Eris couldn't help but feel a little foolish. Hearing Bugenhagen's story had made her feel so alone all of a sudden, and guilty as she had been using the planet's spirit energy without even realizing it. Did that make her as bad as the Shinra, who manufactured it every day? Standing up, Eris reached behind her and slowly pulled the ribbon out of her hair. Her long brown hair fell loosely onto her back in long, wavy strands, blowing back in the breeze. With the ribbon in her hands Eris looked down and gazed upon the ball of materia she never used. A keepsake. A memory of her mother. Nothing more. Was this shimmering white ball of materia once part of the planet's spirit energy? Are you all right? 
Eris jumped and turned around. Cloud was standing a meter behind her, looking a little concerned. The red light of the sky was reflecting in his eyes right then, making the blue glow seem almost red. She looked at him for a second, before she turned back to the sunset. I'm sorry, she said, and leaned on the rail again. It's just... Hearing that story... She lowered her head, and her long brown hair fell loosely around her face. I guess now I understand what the planet was trying to say. It's crying. Crying, because the spirit energy is being sucked out of it. Can't we do anything to help it? Cloud asked her. He walked over to her and stood beside her at the rail. From where they were he could see the entire canyon, and the bright orange glow of the campfire in the middle of the village. I don't know, Eris admitted sadly, tightening her grip on the ribbon. All I know is, the more spirit energy that is lost, the quicker this planet will die. Each day more spirit energy is drawn from it. In the end, I don't know if it is possible. Eris pushed herself away from the rail and turned away from Cloud, walking away from the rail. Cloud watched her as she pulled her long brown hair back up and tied the ribbon around it, securing it all with the ball of materia to keep her hair back. When she was done, she ran her fingers through the long strips of her fringe, moving it back out of her eyes. UUMM? She said suddenly. She turned back to Cloud. Do you mind if I stay up in the canyon for a bit? I want to talk to the elders about the planet. Cloud shook his head. No, go ahead, he said. Thank you, Eris replied with a smile. As everyone suspected the night drew in quick and fast once the sun disappeared behind the horizon. The deep orange-red glow of evening rapidly disappeared and became the dark blue of the night. Dozens of stars became visible after that, until the sky was filled with them, clustering together in thick, sparkly dots. Down in Cosmo Canyon, the campfire in the middle of the village was still burning brightly. With fresh sticks of wood thrown in to keep it going for another hour, the fire emitted a lovely warm glow around the area, keeping Cloud and the others all nice and warm as they sat and enjoyed the night sky. Eris had returned after a while talking with the elders, and Red Thirteen was also sat with them, his head resting on his paws as he stared into the fiery sparks of the fire. On the whole, Cosmo Canyon had been a very interesting place. Barrett, Cat, and Tifa had learned a great deal from the people, about the planet and about the canyon itself. The canyon did not impress only Yuffie, although that was not much of a surprise considering her one-track mind. Even as they all sat around the campfire, with Red Thirteen as head on his paws and Cat curled up on top of the mog, Yuffie was the only one restless, itching to go somewhere. What a boring place, just like I thought. She said with a fierce frown, deliberately making her voice louder so everyone could hear her. I wanna go somewhere. Let's go find some materia. No one took any notice of Yuffie's outburst, and the girl slumped on the ground in a huff, her shuriken pointing down with her arms hanging over the top, trying her hardest to look bored. Cat was sat near to her, lying on his side with his head resting on his closed fist as he stared into the fire. I wonder how many years it's been. The cat mumbled quietly to himself. Gosh, it brings back memories. Cosmo Canyon. This is where Avalanche was born. Barrett said suddenly, and Cat looked across the fire to him. Barrett was sat with his legs spread out in front of him, close to the warm heat of the fire. I promised my guy someday. When we saved the planet from the Shinra, that we'd all go to Cosmo Canyon to celebrate. Biggs. Wedge. Jesse. Now they're all gone. Died for the planet. Saying those words make Barrett stop and reconsider. Back in Midgar. As far as Biggs, Wedge, and Jesse were concerned, Avalanche was all about saving the planet from the Shinra. For Barrett, and Tifa he supposed, it was more a case of revenge for the pain that had been caused to them. Really? To save the planet? He asked aloud. He sighed heavily, looking to the rocky ground. We all... We all hate the Shinra? Do I even got a reason to go on? Will they... Will they ever forgive me? As though to answer his own question he shook his head, feeling he wasn't making much sense. Right now, I really don't know. But I know one thing. If there's anything I can do, to save the planet. Or the people living on it. Then I'm gonna do it. I don't care if it's justice or revenge, or whatever. I don't care. Let them decide for themselves. In a rush Barrett stood up, feeling suddenly energized after staring for so long into the fire. 
it was as though the heat of the fire was now burning through his veins, pumping him up with new energy. Before it had been all about revenge, and although he still wanted revenge on the Shinra for what they did to Karel, hearing the words of the elders of Cosmo Canyon made him want to do more for the planet. And he expressed that desire vocally, making everyone around him jump. Urg! I'm gonna do it! He roared, his voice echoing through the canyon. Again! Again! Avalanche is born again! Everyone stared at Barrett as he stood there for a moment or two, his gun arm raised high above his head as he stared up at the sky with fire burning in his eyes. Then one by one everyone turned and looked away, looking off in different directions as silence once again spread around them. As Tifa looked away, she turned her gaze back towards the fire burning in front of her. Her boots lay close to the burning sparks of wood, and she could feel the heat through the thickness of the leather, but she wasn't interested in that. She was more interested in staring into the flames themselves, and watching the way the fiery sparks danced about in the air, jumping up and disappearing into the air. Towards the middle of the fire the color turned to a deeper red, with faint shadows moving in the center. She stared silently for a second before she blinked and looked at the ground, her eyes watering from the heat. Cloud! She said suddenly, her voice quiet. Cloud, who was sat beside her, looked up. Tifa pulled her knees up towards her chest and wrapped her arms around them feeling her boots beginning to cool now her feet were away from the fire. Bonfires are funny, aren't they? They make you remember all sorts of things. Cloud gazed at her, and for a moment he saw the same look on Tifa's face that he had seen on Eris's face outside Bugenhagen's house. It was a sad expression, the corners of her mouth turned down into a silent frown. You know, Cloud. Five years ago. The young woman said. Cloud nodded, surprised at Tifa's nervous tone. Tifa suddenly shook her head and her dark brown hair fell over her face and shielded her scared look from Cloud. It's nothing. No, forget it. I'm afraid to ask. What is it? Cloud asked. Tifa sighed heavily, and brushed her hair aside as Barrett finally sat down after feeling awkward as the only one standing. It feels like... It feels like you're going far away. She said. She turned and looked at Cloud, staring deep into his eyes. You really, really are. You? Right. Cloud blinked and looked back at Tifa, unsure of what to say. The young woman quickly turned away from Cloud, choosing to put her head on her knees to avoid looking at him. While she wasn't looking Cloud turned towards the fire and looked into it the flames. They looked like ordinary flames, flickering around as they licked over the wooden sticks, burning over the brown bark until it became dark and crisp. Every time there was a gentle breeze the flames swished over to one side, threatening to blow out but always returning to its original position. Maybe it was just him, but he couldn't see whatever it was Tifa was seeing. Unless she was thinking about Nibelheim again. On the other side of the fire, Eris was also staring into the fire. I learned a lot, she said over the gentle roar of the fire. The elders taught me many things. About the Cetra. And the promised land. I'm. Alone. I'm all alone now. But I'm. We're here for you, right? Said Cloud. I know. I know, but. I am the only. Cetra. Does that mean we can't help? Eris didn't reply. Instead, she just slowly turned her head away from the fire, letting its light shine on her hair instead. The fiery red glow shone against her silky brown hair and made the materia flush red. Eris breathed silently. Clearly her talk with the elders had not eased her worries as much as she thought it would. Long ago, Red Thirteen said suddenly, not lifting his head from his paws. When I was still very small, we were all around this flame. Just as suddenly he shook his head, and looked down. No, never mind. Cloud sat upright from where he had leaned back and looked over at Red Thirteen. What happened? He asked. He knew something had been on Red Thirteen's mind, for he had been quiet ever since they had sat around the fire for warmth, watching the night sky take over. The hound sighed heavily, wondering where to begin. The others waited while he scratched his nose with his paw and settled down again, with one paw resting above the other to support his head as he lay down. It's about my parents, he said finally. When I talk about my mother, I am full of pride and joy. And that's fine. But when I remember my father, my heart is full of anger. 
You really can't forgive your father. At the sound of Bugenhagen's voice, Red 13 raised his head from his paws and looked across the fire. Bugenhagen was standing on the other side, his body outlined by the light of the fire. Although Red 13 couldn't see his grandfather's expression, he was sure that it wasn't a smile. Of course, he replied stubbornly. He left my mother for dead. When the Gi tribe attacked, he ran off by himself, leaving mother and the people of the canyon. He shook his head fiercely. Inside him, he could feel his heart thumping loudly inside his chest, sending a rush of hot, angry blood through his veins. Across the fire, Bugenhagen stared at Red 13. Slowly, he was piecing together everything that Red 13 must have been thinking for all the years since then. As a young pup back then, with no real understanding of what was going on around him, it was no wonder that he would misunderstand and form his own truth. He sighed lightly as he came to a decision, and looked up at Red 13. Come, Nanaki, he said. There's something you should see. Red 13 looked up in surprise. Bugenhagen turned away and began to head off away from the fire. He then stopped and turned his head back to the group sitting around the fire. The place may be dangerous. Cloud, will you and one other person come with us? With that remark, Bugenhagen turned away and headed back towards the inner canyon. Red 13 walked slowly behind him, his head up in anxiety but his tail lowered and shuffling limply across the ground as though it was already asleep. They stopped by the stairs and looked back at the campfire, waiting for Cloud. Cloud looked around at the others, looking for their opinion. Tifa and Eris were still pretty quiet and didn't look like they were in the mood for any immediate trips right then. Cat had turned away, mumbling quietly to himself about it being too dangerous and he didn't want to ruin fur. The only ones who didn't look tired or put off were Barrett and Yuffie. Cloud was about to ask Barrett to come along, when Yuffie's eyes lit up as though she just remembered something. Does he want to show him that? She asked aloud. You know, maybe there's some materia that's been passed on for generations in this canyon. Before anyone could stop here, although no one did, Yuffie leapt up to her feet, shuriken in one hand and her armor in the other. Hurriedly, she strapped the armor across her arm and began to punch the air fiercely, firing herself up for the battles ahead. Then she jumped away from the campfire and dashed towards Bugenhagen and Red 13, who were still waiting for them. Cloud sighed and shook his head, before he also crossed the campfire and headed towards the canyon. As the new group of four turned and headed back inside the canyon, Eris slowly turned towards Tifa. I wonder what he wants to show Red 13? She asked. End of chapter Episode 5, Part 05, Chapter 05 Chapter 5 Cloud, Red 13 and Yuffie all followed closely behind Bugenhagen as he continued to lead them through the main part of the cavern, slowly taking them upwards towards the second floor. The corridors were all empty now, with all the shops shut and doors closed, and the only light coming from fiery torches that lined the walls and cast dancing shadows just like the campfire outside. Their silhouettes moved and danced freely across the walls as they headed on. The corridors were also eerily silent, which only enhanced the mood that had settled among them. It was an uneasy mood, for Bugenhagen and Red 13 were both so very silent as they walked along. The only sound came from Cloud and Yuffie's boots as they walked, along with the soft patter of Red 13's paws on the rock. There was no laughter or chatter anymore, and the whole canyon was suddenly given a very different, almost scary air. They headed round and up towards the second floor of the canyon. For a moment Cloud wondered if Bugenhagen was taking them back up to his house, but he quickly dismissed the idea as Bugenhagen went straight past the ladder and stopped in front of the strange machine he had spotted earlier. His eyes glanced over towards the locked metal door beside them, before he turned back to Bugenhagen. The old man was right by the machine now, looking back at them as they gathered around him. Ho ho ho, he said. Are we all set? Cloud looked around at Yuffie and Red 13. The feisty young ninja was all set, with her shuriken close to hand and her arm guard fixed firmly in place. Red 13 was equally prepared, but Cloud could see the sudden anxiety that had filled the hound. His muscles were firm and ready, but his tail was twitching nervously, something that was beyond his control and reminded Cloud that, despite his maturity, Red 13 was still only a teenager at heart. Yeah, Cloud replied finally, turning back to Bugenhagen. The old man nodded in reply. Ho ho ho. Shall we go? Bugenhagen then turned away from Cloud and the others and faced the machine that stood behind him. 
Over the years, many layers of dust had covered the machine, and there were even faint traces of rust forming at the edges, another sign that it had not been used for a very long time. As they watched, Bugenhagen went right up to the machine and placed his palm firmly on the side of what at first appeared to be a blank, thin metal plate. Once his palm is in place a long line of green light slid down from underneath the plate and under Bugenhagen's hand, scanning his palm print. Once the scan was complete a loud whoosh of air wafted in from the side as the metal door suddenly slid open. Beyond the door lay a tunnel, shrouded almost completely in darkness. They could not see more than a few meters in, or what lay beyond it. Bugenhagen stepped away from the machine and hovered in front of the door, motioning to Red 13 and the others to come closer. All right. Come in, come in. Red 13 walked forward and stood beside Bugenhagen. He peered into the dark, shadowy tunnel, but no matter how hard he strained his eyes he could see no more than a few meters ahead. A soft wave of heat and light fell over him and he saw Cloud's dark figure standing next to him, a fiery torch in his hand to light the way. Swallowing hard, Red 13 took the first step into the dark tunnel. Cloud and Yuffie were right behind him, the bright glow of the torch lighting up more of the area so they could see a little more ahead. They had walked no further than a few paces when Red 13 suddenly realized that Bugenhagen was not following them. He stopped and turned back to the old man, who was still by the entrance. Hey! Aren't you going with us, Grandpa? What are you crazy? Bugenhagen replied in surprise. It's dangerous in there. I told you that. You want an old man like me to go first? I'll be right behind you. As if to prove his point, Bugenhagen then entered the tunnel. He paused for a moment as he slid the door shut behind them, leaving it open just enough so that a crack of light from outside could be seen through the shadows. Now they were almost entirely in shadow, with only the light of the torch guiding the way. They all remained very close together as they headed down the tunnel, Bugenhagen staying at the very back of the group just like he had promised, hovering above Red 13's tail. Cloud held the torch up in front of him as they walked, its orange-red light lighting up the walls for a good few meters around them. Even so they very nearly missed the entrance to the next floor, accessible only through a large hole in the middle of the floor. It was naturally carved, and had a thick length of rope tied to a short wooden pole that had been jammed roughly into the rock. After confirming with Bugenhagen that this was the way to go, they began the terrifying task of heading down. Going down the hole was a much more difficult task than it first proved to be, especially since it was hard to see even with the torchlight. As Cloud held the torch out over the hole they could see another rocky ledge below. Red 13 was able to jump down easily and landed on the ledge, while Bugenhagen simply floated down through the shadows until he hovered beside the hound. When it came to Yuffie's turn to slide down, she decided to play it safe and use the rope ladder to head down. With her fingers curled firmly around the thick sides of the rope she slid down, careful not to swing too much on the rope in case she accidentally slipped off the edge of the rock and tumbled deeper into the hole. Thankfully she reached the floor easily, and allowed Cloud to follow her. They had to go down a number of similar levels in order to reach the bottom. Each level they went down was more terrifying than the last, for the air was becoming colder and thicker with a deeper sense of unease and apprehension. They finally reached the bottom after climbing down a long length of rope, much longer than Red 13 had anticipated when he took the leap down and ended up falling further towards the shadows below. It was only his agile reflexes that kept him from hurting himself and landing safely. Once they were all on the ground, they headed on towards the next area of the cavern. Bugenhagen directed them towards an open hole in the side of the wall, barely visible in the darkness. It seemed to be the only way to go, so they went through. They were surprised to discover that it was lighter in the next room, despite being so deep inside the depths of Cosmo Canyon. The light came from the jagged walls and ceilings, where a strange, gooey substance lightly covered the walls like the trail of a snail. The substance gave off a foul smell, or maybe that came from what else was lying hidden inside the shadows of the tunnel. Bugenhagen was leading the way now, braving the front of the line and guiding them all through. He seemed to know which way to go despite it being so dark, and the others were reassured that at least someone knew where they were going. Over here, the old man said, stopping next to the wall of a tunnel. He pointed towards an even darker shadowy gap where the gooey substance did not shine. In there is a switch. It should open the door to the next chamber. Be careful, though. Cloud nodded, and passed the torch over to Bugenhagen. He walked into the small dark crevice and began to feel around for the switch. For a while all he could feel was solid rock, but then he felt the old feel of wood and metal and began to work the switch. It was rusty, though, so he took his time. As they all stood there in silence waiting for Cloud to finish working the switch, Yuffie suddenly felt a cold wave pass across the side of her face. 
it was a light touch, as though cold fingers were slowly feeling their way across her skin, heading down towards her neck. Before they could get there, she jumped and cried out, flicking her shuriken out to attack whatever it was behind her. She was even more surprised when her shuriken hit the side of the wall, hitting rock instead of flesh. She opened her eyes and stared at the point where her shuriken blade penetrated the rock, and the empty space around it. She was positive that she had felt something touch her face, and yet there was absolutely nothing there. Had she just imagined it? Yuffie! said Red Thirteen, looking over at the girl. What's wrong? Did you hear something? Yuffie turned back and shook her head. No, she replied, rather curtly. I just had a twitch, that's all. With that she turned and walked away, taking a few steps away from the safety of the firelight and deeper into the shadows. Within those few steps her foot caught the edge of something lying in a heap on the ground. And as she looked down and saw what it was, her heart almost stopped beating. It was a skeleton, a skeleton stripped down to its bones lying in a helpless heap against the wall of the tunnel. There were a few shreds of clothing left on its frail frame, and in its bony fingers was an old metal sword covered in dust and dirt. The bones were grey with age, and as she had touched the side of its leg it broke. Yuffie stared, mouth open and her hands trembling. Yet nothing scared her more as to what happened next. As she stood there staring at the seemingly lifeless skeleton, it suddenly twitched and lifted up its head to look at her. Yuffie's entire body began to tremble as those empty black sockets that once held eyes turned and gazed up at her, its lifeless grin leering up at her. Yuffie turned away, a loud scream escaping her breathless lungs as she ran back towards Red 13 and the others. Bugenhagen and Red 13 stared as the girl skidded to a stop beside them, her face pale even in the firelight. All right, this place is way creepy. Yuffie shouted, her voice trembling. I've had enough. I say we go back right now. Go back if you want to, said Cloud from the crevice, his fingers working through the last bits of the switch. But you'll be on your own in the dark. Yuffie glared angrily at him, but she had no time to yell her reply. Cloud finished pulling the switch, and a loud grating noise echoed throughout the tunnels. At the same time, the cold chill in the air turned even colder, making everyone shiver. Laughter then began to ring throughout the tunnels. Eerie, deathly laughter, filled with mockery and hatred. Cloud looked ahead into the crevice as a white figure suddenly emerged from behind the wall. A thin white face with red eyes glared at him before bursting out of the wall, passing right through Cloud's face and shoulders and out into the tunnels. There were more of the ghastly-looking creatures floating around the tunnel, each of them laughing at the terrified group below as they flew around in the air. Yuffie was screaming, while Red Thirteen snarled and snapped his jaws at any of them that dared to come near. He managed to lock his jaws around one of them, but was shocked when his teeth passed right through the flesh. In response the ghostly figure turned and laughed, before flying off with its comrades into the tunnel. Bugenhagen was the only one unafraid of the strange creatures. He walked on with the torch up towards the top of the tunnel, where a large door had opened up in the side of the wall. He looked up at the quickly scattering ghosts, watching as they began to fly off down the other tunnels away from them. Ho ho ho, he laughed. Everyone here's a ghost of the Gi tribe. Killed in a certain battle. Red Thirteen stopped snapping his jaws at the empty air, and looked over at his grandfather. A certain battle? He asked. There was a question buzzing under the tip of his tongue, but Bugenhagen was talking again and he didn't dare ask it. The vengeful spirits of the Gi didn't disappear, and couldn't return to the life stream. The old man said. He motioned them all towards the door. We still have far to go. Ho ho ho. He then walked boldly through the open door, forcing the others to follow him if they wanted to remain in the safety of the firelight. Red 13 followed almost reluctantly, wondering about what Bugenhagen was up to. The next area was similar to the first, although there were many hazardous drops leading to deeper parts of the cavern. So the group stayed in a single line, with Bugenhagen holding up the torch at the front to light the way. With the light they could see a little over the edge of the pass, which rapidly turned into shadow. Cloud even dropped a rock down, but he could not hear it land. They were very glad to have Bugenhagen with them at that point, for he was able to warn them of all the hidden traps within the cave. One in particular was just ahead. A slippery, oily substance had been thickly laid across the floor near the end of the path, heading right towards a series of sharp metal spikes waiting at the end of the path. Without Bugenhagen's guidance, they would have stepped on the oil and skidded right to their deaths. So they carefully made their way around the substance, listening to the disappointed laughs of the gee ghosts as they headed up towards the next area. There was another cave door at the top of the next area, and Bugenhagen stopped again. 
he turned and waited for the others to catch up to him, and waved towards the door. As you can see, this cave leads to the back of Cosmo Canyon, he explained. He turned to the door and floated a little towards it, letting the firelight create more dancing shadows around it. It was unfortunate that the Gi were larger than us. If they attacked through here, we wouldn't have stood a chance. Red 13 mumbled thoughtfully. Bugenhagen looked down at the hound's serious face, before turning back to the door. Let's move on, he said, and headed through the door. The others followed him through, now very aware of the increasing sense of hatred that filled every tunnel. They were sure that they were coming close to the source of all the hatred now, and thinking of what it could be made their hearts skip a beat. Deep inside the dark depths of the next tunnels, the sleeping creature slowly stirred as it heard the sound of faint footsteps enter the cavern. With it came the equally faint scent of meat, living, breathing meat that could mean only one thing, and that was fresh prey. Slowly the creature opened up a few of its many tiny black eyes and peered out through the shadows towards the ground below. Through the many twists and turns of the old white web that hung on all sides of the cavern, the creature could see its prey. There were four of them in all, an elderly man, a much younger man and a younger girl, as well as a dog. Although it did not care for the old man, the creature knew right away that the other two were perfect prey. Although something about the dog made it uneasy, it sent recalling some faint memory of many years past. Its mind awakening with the smell of food, the creature began to uncurl its eight stick-like legs. Each of its joints faintly cracked as they unfolded and stretched out, the sharp claws of its feet grasping onto the non-sticky parts of the web that it had made its home. Eight legs attached to a small rounded body began to move steadily across the ceiling. Down below, Cloud and the others had just reached the edge of the web. It spread over four different tunnels and left its remains all along the walls, as well as the remains of a few of its unfortunate victims that were caught and snatched up. Unable to go further because of the web, Cloud stepped forward and placed one finger on one of the silver strings. Strangely enough it seemed to shimmer at his touch, the entire web shaking every so slightly. It was also incredibly sticky, he discovered, stretching slightly as he pulled his hand away before flicking back into place again. Can we get through? asked Red 13. Cloud did not answer him, and instead decided to try something a little more forceful. He drew his sword from behind him and held it up above his head. He then brought it down hard, the blade hitting the sticky edges and cutting through. The strings were tougher than he thought, and it took a few more strong pushes to get the blade right through the string. The moment the blade sliced through the web, a gentle ringing sound began to echo throughout the tunnel. Cloud froze, his blade still stuck in the edges of the web. Everyone around him froze as well, listening as the faint ringing vibrated across the web and up into the tunnel, like a warning bell. Up in the recesses of the tunnel, the creature stirred a little more. It turned its body slowly towards the sound of the ringing, using its more accurate hearing to guide it towards the web that had been disturbed by its prey. Its small but deadly jaws clicked loudly in response to the ringing, beginning to quicken its pace before its prey could figure out what was going on. I don't like the sound of that clicking, Bugenhagen commented, still holding the torch up so they could all see around them. Red 13 lifted his head suddenly as he caught a foul scent on the air, and he began to growl deep within his throat. Yuffie looked round and round, until finally she lifted up her head and cried out, pointing to the top of the web. All at once everyone turned and looked up, and there, on the top of the web, was the creature. A gigantic spider at least four times their size, standing perched on the other side of the web against the ceiling. Its jaws clicked hungrily as it opened all eight of its eyes on the group, sticky saliva dripping from its mouth. Cloud! Red 13 shouted to him. Get away from there! Cloud tugged hard on his sword, trying to pull it free of the web. It wouldn't budge, and as he looked down he saw that the ends of the web had melted to form a firm sticky coating around his blade, solidifying to hold the blade completely in place. No matter how hard he tugged and twisted the blade, the new coating just wouldn't let go and his sword was stuck. Above him, the spider slowly stuck two of its legs through one of the small holes of the web, supporting itself before it stuck its body through the gap. Lastly it brought its legs out so that it was fully on their side of the web. Its eight eyes moved around from one person to another, from Bugenhagen to Red 13 to Yuffie, before finally settling its gaze on Cloud at the bottom of the web. It then began to move slowly downwards, its jaws clicking even more hungrily. Cloud continued to pull on his sword, determined to get it free of the web. He could hear the spider's jaws clicking above him, one after another, preparing to make its rapid pounce that would end his life. He then had an idea, and snapped his head around to Red 13. Red 13! 
he shouted back to the hound. Give me your fire materia. For a moment Red Thirteen just stared, unable to catch on to what Cloud was thinking. He suddenly felt a tug as Yuffie snatched the green ball of materia from his headband and hurled it towards Cloud. Cloud caught it in his hand and turned back to his sword, pulling out the lightning materia and slotting in the fire materia. He activated it instantly and jumped back away from the blade. As the materia glowed, a single fiery spark ignited at the blade's tip. Within a second that spark exploded and enlarged, a coating of pure flame spreading across the blade. It touched the sticky substance of the web and that also ignited, immediately spreading from the sword to the rest of the web. The spider didn't have a chance to react. With its poor sight all it could see was a sudden red blur before the flames rose up and engulfed it, its body bursting into flames. The spider screeched loudly, until the flames silenced its screech. By the time the flames faded, there was nothing left of the spider. There was nothing left of the web, either, both of them completely destroyed by the flames. All that was left was a few dusty remains of the spider's body, crumbling to dust on the floor. Cloud's sword was now free, lying on the pile of dust. Cloud picked it up, taking out the fire materia and throwing it back to Red 13. Well, that was... interesting. Red 13 said, walking over to the edges of the tunnel and looking up to where the web had been. Yuffie fell down onto her knees, her hands falling limp at her sides. I don't like this place anymore, she groaned. Materia or not, I want to leave. Can we go back? Not yet, Bugenhagen told her. We still have a little way to go yet. Follow me. With that the old man headed on through the tunnel, the torch lighting up the dark sides of the walls. Red 13 and Cloud followed closely behind, while Yuffie slowly climbed to her feet and shuffled on after them, muttering moodily under her breath. Bugenhagen came to a stop again at the very top of the cavern, beside yet another cave door leading into darkness. This warrior went through the cave alone, he said, looking through the door. Fighting attackers one after another. Grandpa? Red 13 said, the question burning underneath his tongue. That warrior? Bugenhagen looked down at Red 13's face. He still looked like the earnest young Nanaki he had always known, but now there were traces of fear and anxiety in his face. He smiled faintly. Ho ho ho! We're almost there! He said. They went on through the next tunnel, and entered what they presumed to be the final cavern. It was a much larger cavern, and all around them were large chunks of rock and stalagmites, as well as stalactites hanging down from the ceiling. There were also a number of open pits filled with burning hot lava, creating giant clouds of steam that filled the cavern. There was also a foul stench hanging in the air. At the very head of the cavern, on the far wall, there was a giant carving. It was built in the shape of a face or a battle mask, glaring out silently at the rest of the cavern with angry eyes. Bugenhagen was the first to enter the cavern, and from the moment he passed underneath the door he felt the change in the air. All the anxiety, all the hatred. All of it was centered in this very cave. There were many key tribe ghosts roaming this cave, hiding in corners like more spiders waiting to attack. Yet, what scared him the most was the giant rocky mask blocking the cave's exit. What is this? He asked, stopping in the center of the cave and looking up. His hand was shaking as he held the torch, sensing the anger coming from the statue. Red 13 walked up behind him, also sensing the hatred coming from the statue. Grandpa, is he? After death. The ghosts of the Gi. Like stagnant air. This. Can't be. At that moment, the eyes of the statue suddenly lit up into a fierce and angry red. Like dark red pupils they darted around until they locked eyes with the group standing in the middle of the cavern. Then the ghostly tongue licked out from the open mouth of the statue, and a low growl rumbled deep within it. End of chapter